Good morning. My, my name is Richard Ousu. Welcome to Somerset Presbyterian Church today on this is Sunday of Easter. I would like also to wish all the mothers a very happy Mother's Day. This morning, we wish to welcome Jennifer Rimm back to our puppet. Jennifer has just completed her Master of Divinity at Princeton Theological Seminary. She visited us in the summer of 2021 as part of her field education. She, was be, she will be returning home to North Carolina to continue her discernment of where God is calling her in ministry. She is excited to come full circle with us here at Somerset Presbyterian during her seminary experience. Today, we will be receiving the Blanket Sunday offering. Just $10 purchases a blanket, which can mean so much to someone in need. Special offering envelopes are available in the netters, or you can use a few envelope and mark it accordingly. Please, please check out all our announcements and the prayer list in the bulletin and on the SPC website. Let's, let us worship God. The day. Gracious God, on this day when we celebrate the love within the hope, remember your love embodied in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to model our love, <coughs> sorry, love after his servant love, which bows down to the to cradle of the venerable enhance that of a healing and life-giving touch. We pray this in his name. Amen. All who are able, please stand. Let us join together in our call to worship. From the north and south, from the east and west, All with hands raised high or hearts quietly pondering. Bringing our love, open our minds. We draw near to God, near to each other, and near to Christ, the Word of God. Please be seated. Would all the men now please come up to the choir you know <laughs> <don't know. laughs> to sing Hymn 473 for the beauty of the earth? Mother's Day version.
Come on. I can't even snap my fingers. You can smile. <laughs> If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Spirit of us all, we know you are promised along this way. We understand the Holy Spirit in your gifts to all. We hear the message of Christ's sacrifice. We like we for children. We need to be guided to our own house when we disobey. To teach us once again that we have fallen short of your expectation. We try to repent. We try to change our minds to turn our lives. Help us to live once again through your love and forgiveness that we may see Christ in us around us and before us. Amen. Amen. Please join me in a, a moment of silent reflection. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. Saved by love and covered in grace, we are forgiven and reconciled with God. Please stand and join me in singing praise to God for the gift of grace. The Gloria Patron, hymn 579. of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us now share the peace of God and the love of Christ with one another with a parried will. You may be seated. So it's sad. 
says, what is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while nobody has seen all of God, because God is too far too big for any of us to fully see, we can know what God is like. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift, with wings so wide you can play under their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up strong as a tree. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of them and the age of their names by heart. God is like the stars, forever present and bright. Even when they feel far away, you can always look up and see them winking at you. God is like a fort, strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe. Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you are scared or need a quiet place to rest. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants, waters, weeds, and fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle, warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkest of nights. God is like the wind, passionate and full of mystery. God is both here and mysteriously also over there. God is everywhere, just like you said, swirling throughout the world, whistling across mountain ranges, rustling through the trees and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable always busy making and remaking everything brilliant and new. You make art at school and then bring it home. Your parents put it on the refrigerator and your aunt and uncle grandma. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. And that's what we're celebrating today. It's mothers. But we do this too. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a glorified view of all creation. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all people after a storm. And because we know what God is like, we know that God is kind, God is forgiving. God is slow to get angry. God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. She is your protector. He is trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God hopes. God perseveres. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world, throughout all time, have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe. What makes you feel brave. And what makes you feel loved. Because that is what God is. The greatest thing that there could ever be is that Jesus loves me.
Will you pray with me? Ever speaking God, open our hearts and minds to seek your spirit of truth. Bless us with your wisdom and reveal the power, promise of your love through the reading of your holy word. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Psalms, Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my tongue, with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If, he, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. First, I'd like to thank you for having me here again this morning. It is a delight to be asked to come back and seems fitting to finish out my time in New Jersey at one of the places I started at. I also didn't realize how important today would be. One of the hardest things about being in New Jersey has not being able not to spend a lot of holidays with my mom, um, who I will see tomorrow for the first time since Christmas. So um, this has been really wonderful and I really um, loved the song and thank you for sharing that with me. Um, but I will be admit, admit to being a little busy with studying over the last three years, so I haven't had my pulse on the world as much as I might have otherwise had. But as far as I can tell, it's a pretty dark world out there. If you spend just a little time watching television, listening to the radio, or looking at social media, you would be convinced that the apocalypse is coming. Now, I'm not here this morning to convince you that this is not true. I didn't learn that kind of theology at Princeton. However, I am here to tell you that all is not lost. In our scripture this morning, Jesus is telling the disciples that he is going to die. He will no longer be physically present on this earth to guide them. It reminds me of that first time you leave home. If you're lucky like I was, you had parents to guide you along the way and help you to make good decisions, ones they want you to continue to make after you leave home. Now, whether we do that or not, well, that's a whole other story. In our context, however, Jesus tells the disciples that God will send along an advocate to help guide them because they will not be able to handle all that will happen alone. 
The original Greek word is paraclete, and scholars tend to agree that the writer of the Gospel of John is referring here to the Holy Spirit, who will be present with the disciples to help them continue their ministries. I spent quite a few classroom hours over the last three years devoted to issues of social justice, including having the historical opportunity to take the course with one of the authors of the Confession of Belhar, which is that the Confession of Belhar is included in the PCUSA Book of Confessions, part of our denominational constitution. I won't get deep into it, but that document was published by the Dutch Reformed Mission Church, which was considered the biracial church in South Africa during apartheid. This body of the church declared 40 years ago that due to apartheid, the conviction of the gospel was at stake and that the faith needed to be proclaimed. And if you're not aware, apartheid was a government system in South Africa that mandated segregation between white people and anyone with a drop of black blood in everything. Does that sound familiar? Another text I was able to spend some time with was a letter from a Birmingham jail by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This letter was written in response to seven white clergymen that felt that the nonviolent protests by Dr. King and his counterparts were too radical. It reads in part using the language of the time. I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of ten tension, to make a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. More devoted to order than to justice. I think a little bit of a difference in the response to the Black Lives Matter marches and the events of January 6th. How some of us interpreted them. Trust me, it isn't only in my home region of the South. And no matter our feelings about them, we all must admit we have feelings. It is everywhere. I've heard a lot over the last three years the phrase, the scriptures are clear. Is it though? I grew up in a tradition where we had multiple translations of the Bible. The New International Version that you all use, the Living Bible, I was presented with the Gold Good News Bible, probably in second grade, several devotional style Bibles, and at school we used the New Revised Standard Version. So it was clear to me that the scriptures were not clear, far from it. However, there are two things I am certain that the scriptures are clear about. Love God and love others. We only have to look at the scripture to see it. Our reading this morning begins in the NRSV. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now your third thought might be, Jesus had commandments? I thought there were only ten, and those were in the first part. But yes, Jesus had a commandment. In the next chapter, chapter 15, Jesus says to the disciples, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Ouch. I don't know about you, but that one kind of hits me like a gut punch. Now you might be thinking, what do these things have to do with one another? Confessions, Dr. King, Jesus, gut punches, absolutely nothing. I mean, I just finished three years of school on Thursday, and I had to come up with something to say to you this morning. I'm actually just kidding. I actually haven't walked across the stage yet, so I probably should be a little bit more careful. <laughs> what is key to all of this is that Jesus commands us to love others the way he has loved us. The way God loves us. The way the Spirit loves us. The way Jesus is telling the disciples that the Holy Spirit will come and walk beside them in their future ministries. And I wonder sometimes if our failure to love others is rooted in our failure to remember how Jesus loves us. Last time I was here, we were 16 months into the pandemic. And the first time, and although the official pandemic may be over, we are still living with the after effects. 
Some of us may be immunocompromised and still very afraid of getting sick. There is long COVID to think about. There is grief that is certainly not processed. The physical trauma and tension that we hold, and not to mention the previously mentioned constant news cycle that settles in our everyday lives. But one thing I did learn over the last three years that I want to share with you this morning is that there is only one of me. I, Jennifer, was created as a child of God. There is no other me. God only created one me. Now that might seem a bit dumb to say, of course there's only one of me. But stop for a second and realize that there has only ever and will only ever be one of you. You were created in the image of God. There is no one else like you in the history of creation, and there will never be anyone like you in the future of creation. Natural creation, at least. Sit with that for just a minute. The writers of the Confession of Belhar called the document a cry from the heart for change in the church. At that time, there were three Dutch Reformed churches, a white one, a biracial one, and a black one. Remember, I said everything was segregated. I wonder if when we hold others in judgment, we are really crying out for love. If we hold our trans siblings in judgment, is it because we have doubts about how much God loves us? And we need to take a second and remember that God created us all in God's image, including our trans siblings. If we hold judgment on people of a different color, is it because we have forgotten that Jesus had only one commandment? But we forgot this because we forgot how Jesus loves us. If we hold judgment about others in a different financial status than ourselves, is that because we forgot that Jesus was sending the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to the disciples and for us because he knew we needed to be reminded of the commandment to love others on a regular basis? I contend that this is entirely possible. If you're like me, you have likely spent most of your life intertwined with institutions. You are either in school or went to school, then you began working for a company or some other identity. You may be a parent, a daughter, a brother, or an uncle. I realized during my time at Princeton that I had always defined my identity by who I was and what I did. I was an accountant, and I was a good one, but I went to work and I got paid, and I produced a product that was consumed. I am a daughter, I am an aunt. So when I came to PTS, all I could see were the flaws of the institution. We always see the flaws in our institutions. Very few people stand around the water cooler and talk about how awesome things are all the time, right? But what I eventually realized is I am not the institution. You are not the institutions that you operate in. The world tells us that we are defined by what we do and how productive we are. How hard do we work? How high are our grades? How tall are we? How much do we weigh? Where is any of that in scripture? I mean, I seem to remember a little part about Jesus getting mad in the temple, but whatever. <laughs> I wonder what would happen if we all spent more time every day thinking about what it means that God created us and loves us and how amazing that makes us. Even when we mess up, we might be inspired to love others just a little bit more. But in this scripture, Jesus warns the disciples and us that we won't be able to do it alone. We will need help from other people. And I wonder what would happen if we started to love other people a little bit more if those people might become our LGBTQIA plus siblings. I wonder if they might become our siblings of color. I wonder if we might decide that we wanted to figure out how to eradicate poverty by being alongside people of different financial statuses. That is what the writers of the Confession of Belhar felt as a cry from the heart. We needed to be reminded that God loves us so much that we are commanded to love others just as much. That is what Dr. King was trying to prove in his nonviolent protest, that Jesus loves us so much 
that we are commanded to love others just as much. That is what that gut punch is reminding us of. The Holy Spirit is reminding us of how much we are loved. And the Spirit is reminding us we might want to work on loving other people a little bit more. So my question to you this morning is, are the scriptures clear? And what if the song is right and all we need is love? I think we know what Jesus could tell us. Amen. Let us now stand and sing hymn number 467, How Great Thou Art. remain standing for the affirmation of faith. This morning, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Maimonides was a Jewish philosopher who said sometimes the problem is we're trying to make sense of life for our own private lives and are forgetting that our lives are interconnected. In Guide for the Perplexed, Maimonides said, there is no difference between the pain of humans and the pain of other living beings, since the love and tenderness of the mother for the young are not produced by reasoning, but by feelings, and this faculty exists not only in humans, but in most living beings. Will you pray with me? God, who loves us deeper than our understanding, be with us this morning as we exist in a world filled with war. Military war, language wars, wars on bodies, wars on truth, wars on fear, and far more wars that only you know of. Pray for all of your children so that they hear your call to love each other just a little bit more by remembering how much you love them. We pray for all who are in leadership and government in these times. We pray they can remember your love for them when working together for solutions to the troubles in our country and states. We pray for your church, our denomination, this church, and all of its members. Thank you for the love you have given to us, and let us remember that love and that we are all uniquely created children of God, and all others are too. We pray for the suffering with illness, Christy, Calvin, Gladys, Millie, Ronald. We pray for Fran, Terry, Alicia, Gary, Nancy. We pray for Mary Ann, Louisa, Cindy, Vivian. And we pray for Edmina, Jeanette, Mercedes, and Mary Jane. We pray and mourn together in the death and resurrection with the family of John and the family of Paul and the family of Mysine, the family of Betty, and the family of James. Commanding God, lift us with your spirit when we need to be reminded of the command of Jesus to love one another as he loved us. Now we join together and pray as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Loving God, you have made us your people so that we may speak of your wonderful acts. With gratitude for all we have received, we have come to offer our gifts to you. There are four ways to send in your offering. You can send it in through the regular mail, drop it off at the church, Make a donation through PayPal on the church website where you can place it in the offering plate as it is passed.
families can stand and join me in the doxology. <laughs> I would like to invite you to join us in the fellowship hall following the service for a special brunch in honor of Mother's Day hosted by the Presbyterian Men's Group. And let us remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 525, Here I Am, Lord. Barbara Nickel would like to say a word.
Somerset Presbyterian Church would like to present you with these flowers. Thank you for being here. And now God will leave you and we will miss you and love you. And she'll be graduating from the seminary next year. That's lovely. Thank you. And that's actually my favorite hymn in the world. Uh, Here I am, Lord. I heard it for the first time when I was 14. Um, so, I don't know. It's all been magical. Um, hear now this charge and benediction. Bring God's loving presence to the world. Be companions of kindness to everyone you meet. Go forth, trusting that our companion God goes with us now and forevermore. Amen. What a beautiful name it is, the name.